Hello, and welcome yet again to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. Uh, this is the 13th lecture in our video series, at least lecture number 13, uh, production order, etc. But um, let's see, in this video we'll be exploring our third and final method of determining shear and moment diagrams, and that is finding shear and moment diagrams by method of inspection. Uh, and the method of inspection is where we don't find, directly use the uh, equations for shear and moment. Rather, we apply graphical relationships uh, that we know that we take the uh, calculus relationships, the, sh the moment and or the uh, integral and derivative relationships of shear and moment and load, and apply those to directly getting our shear and moment diagrams. All right, so today we're going to be finishing up our look at shear and moment diagrams. So uh, let's see. We've looked at uh, two methods of finding uh, shear and moment diagrams so far. Again, the topic for today is shear and moment diagrams. And we're going to be looking at our third method that we haven't explored yet. So let's review uh, methods for B&M diagrams. Uh, diagrams and functions. We have a few methods. And we've looked at two, of three, two out of the three of them so far. The first one is by method of sections. And we have considered that. We've seen how you can cut a beam. So if you have a beam like this, and you cut it, and you reveal the internal forces, if you're assuming positive shear and positive moment, you have these kind of forces uh, laid out like this revealed, shear and moment. And then you, you, you either solve for the forces for the shear and moment at the location, either as a function of x or simply uh, at a specific point. Uh, two, we've also looked at by integration. This is where you directly apply calculus and uh, you integrate the load function, uh, integrate across a beam as a function of x for your load function, and then you just uh, apply boundary conditions to solve for your constants of integration. And then three, the one we haven't looked at, is by inspection. And that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, by inspection. Again, these are the primary, uh, primary ways of determining shear and moment diagrams. So far, we've done this one, we've done this one, and then today, we're going to be working on this one. Okay, so um, what is by inspection? What does that mean? Um, we first need to define these terms, define a few terms related to this. Um, and there are many ways like you could refer to this. You could refer, refer to this as by inspection, or you could even refer to it as Oh, by direct application of areas, that sort of thing. Okay, so V and M by inspection. Essentially, we are going to be applying a few basic rules um, to create shear and moment diagrams. So uh, let's think about this. A, um, let's see. So we have a few basic rules. Um, that the method of inspection is based upon. One, uh, we know the uh, uh, know the integral relationships uh, relations between uh, load shear and moment. Namely, that uh, uh, that shear as a function of x is equal to the integral, the negative integral of w as a function of x. And that moment as a function of x is equal to the uh, equal to the integral of shear as a function of x, and of course dx dx. So what uh, what uh, so we know that these uh, uh, we know that these integral relationships exist. And with the method of inspections, we're we're applying it more graphically, or we're taking advantage of our known area relationships uh, with uh, you know shear. Sorry, with uh, integrals, etc. So. Integrals, if you integrate across an x, uh, across a coordinate axis like x, or if you integrate across a beam in this case, if you integrate, you're gathering the area under the curve.
So, uh, in other words, if you have if uh, if you have a load on a beam like so, if this is your load, the change in shear between those two points, uh, if I say between A and B here. is equal to the area under this curve. Uh, area under the load curve. So the area under the load curve will tell you the change in shear uh, between two points. And that's the, and the same thing will hold true for a moment. Uh, if, you, if you take the area under the curve between two points on the uh, shear graph, you will get the change in moment between those two points. And really, this is just a direct application of uh, elementary calculus. Okay, so let's look. So that's our first rule. The first rule we need to be aware of is we need to be aware of the integral relationships, and more specifically, the application of them to area. That if I take the area under a load curve, I get a change in shear, and if I take the area under a shear curve, I get a change in moment. And so that's the first tool we're going to be using. Um, as we work through the uh, as we work through the uh, shear moment diagrams by integration, or sorry, by inspection, and then we do have some other principles we need to discuss that we will use uh, as we work through these. So that's our first bit of knowledge that we're going to apply. And our second one, our second key principle, will be that uh, be, will be the uh, performance or the effect of point loads and reactions. Uh, point loads and reactions cause uh, jumps in uh, v and M diagrams. So, for example, if you have a, uh, let's say you have a uniform load, but at that, but at this location, you have a big point load. So this is not an equivalent point load. This is just a beam that has both a point load and a distributed load on it. What this shear diagram ends up looking, so if this is the load, the shear diagram ends up looking like this, where you have a the reaction on the right will initially cause a jump in the shear diagram. Then the downward load, the, the, the uh, uniform load, will cause a slow decrease uh, in the value of the shear curve. Then this point load will cause a sudden drop in the uh, shear profile. And if this load is equal to P, then this change, the difference between these two points is also P. And then this would go back up to, uh, that would go, that would start uh, increasing again. Actually, that would be a negative slope. The same slope would be maintained. And then you'd end up jumping back up over here on the right side when you got to the other reaction. And if this was AY and this was BY, uh, this value here would be AY, and this value here would be BY. Uh, whenever you have a point load or a reaction, the shear diagram will jump. And as you as you may recall from our uh, lecture uh, examples last time, we looked at the effects of a couple or a point moment on a location on a shear diagram, or sorry, on the moment diagram. And if you have a positive external moment, uh, the, let's say this is equal to M. Well, then let's say you have your moment diagram is some function. You have some sort of moment function, but then um, right at the location of this point moment, because this is at a positive external moment, you will have a drop in your moment diagram function there. And the magnitude of that drop would be equal to M. So positive external moments cause uh, negative uh, changes in the moment diagram. 
Okay, so we have our uh, our knowledge of um, point load reactions, and uh, that's our second principle. And then we're going to look at a third one, and possibly a fourth. And this may, I know this is a lot, but uh, I think I, I want to write it out uh, uh, first, just for the sake of being of uh, completeness and completion. But um, I will say it's not as actually, it's actually not as bad when you get into it. And we will be working through some examples that will hopefully make a lot more sense of this. This is really one of those things that you have to learn by seeing and doing, although I do want to list the formal rules before I begin. All right, so we have our second principle, which is that the effect of point loads and reactions and point moments on shear and moment diagrams. And then we have a few other things. Uh, I would say a third one would be uh, the derivative relations. Between V and M. So we know that shear is equal to the negative integral of load. However, because of this, we can also see that there is a derivative relationship. In other words, uh, the, the derivative of shear with respect to x will be equal to the negative load as a function of x. And we can, and same thing with moments, uh, since moments is equal to the integral of shear as a function of x, then shear is equal to the derivative of moment with respect to x. And crucially, think about this. Um, we know that the derivative of the shear function is equal to the uh, load function, or another way to think of this is that our that this represents uh, the magnitude of this of w as a function of x is the slope of the uh, v of x diagram, and that continues down for a moment. Same for between uh, shear and moment. So the derivative of, uh, so again, the uh, value of the shear curve will tell you the slope of the, mo the moment curve. And the value of the, uh, uh, of the load curve, Rw as a function of x, will give you the slope of your, um, of your uh, shear diagram. Or in other words, if you have a point of max v, Max V of X is often uh, where the slope, or sorry, the, sh the uh, load diagram is equal to zero. Because, der because our load is the derivative of the shear function, uh, we can set a load function equal to zero and find locations of maximum shear. Same thing for moment. You can set V of X equal to zero and then solve for that location uh, that x, uh, that x is uh, where m will be max or min. Okay, that is a long series of very messily written out uh, rules, but these are the general rules we'll be following as we uh, work through some examples using the method of sections. Or, <laughs> my goodness, uh, solving for shear and moment diagrams by inspection. Not method, of inse not method of section, by inspection. Okay, questions so far? Oh. Okay, sorry, if it's hard to see, I'll try to uh, switch colors out. Sorry about that. Um, let me fiddle with that. Let's see if this is, if I can do something to make that any easier.
that any better? Okay, sorry about that. There we go. Okay, so we have our basic rules. We know that, uh, uh, we know that, oh my god, now, now everything's running. <laughs> okay, uh, so we have our uh, basic rules, and again, I did want to write them out for the sake of completion, but um, I wouldn't uh, worry too, about, too bad about memorizing those. What really, what's really important is that you can see how to apply them. Okay, so... Okay, good. All right, so let's actually see what this looks like uh, in an example. So let's say we have, oh, let's just start with a very simple diagram. Let's start with perhaps my favorite diagram, the real simple one. A, sim a simply supported beam with a uniform load across it. So let's say we have a simply supported beam. And it has a load of, oh, I don't know, three kips per foot. And it, let's say it has an, a length of 10 feet. So all this is given, and I want to find our V and M diagrams. So let's find our shearing moment diagrams based on this load diagram. Uh, so I'm going to first find my reactions. And drawing this free body diagram, I'll have an AY and a BY here. So let's say I have an AY and a BY, two reactions. And because this is a nice symmetric beam and everything is balanced and it's a uniform load, I can just say that each of these reactions will be half of the total vertical, uh, downward vertical load. So three kips per foot times 10 feet is 30 kips divided by two is 15 kips. So each of these is equal to 15 kips. All right, simple enough. So I am going to draw some uh, projection lines. I recommend you doing this as well when you uh, work through B&M diagrams, especially, especially with the method of inspection. And this just helps keep uh, everything relatively lined up. And this works a lot better, especially if you're, you know, if you're using a, a uh, uh, some proper engineering paper things on on a board are always a little bit more a little bit messier than working on a, a flat sheet of paper but all right so let's look at our uh, shear first so we have v and this will be in kips so let's say we have our shear in kips and um okay so i know that a a point load at a location or or a point reaction or just a reaction, is going to cause a jump in the shear diagram. An upward jump in my uh, reaction will cause, or a point reaction, will cause an upward jump in my shear diagram. So I know right away that right at the left-hand side of the beam, I'm going to jump up to a, a, a amount equal to this reaction, which is 15 kips. So 15 kips here. Then um, I need to ask myself, okay, um, where is my next point that I should be plotting my uh, shear diagram to? And what I'm really interested in is I'm interested in where is the uh, next discontinuity. But between here and here, the only thing that will be uh, changing on the beam on the shear diagram will be the uh, will be the distributed load, uh, the constant distributed load. And so I can then, uh, when I'm, when looking how where my next point that I need to consider, I can just go to the end of that distributed load. And when, I'm, uh, when I say the point that I need to look at, uh, if I'm going to take the area under this curve, I need to know uh, how far along I should take that area. In the case of this beam, it's relatively simple because we have a, uh, just a single uniform loading across. I can just take my loading all the way to the end of my beam. 
Now, um, let's think about this. So what is our, um, what is the area under this curve? Well, this has an area of um, three kips per foot times a, a height of three kips per foot effectively times a width or a length of 10 feet. So that's a, uh, that is an area under the curve. So if I call this maybe like A1, uh, the area under this curve, and that would be the area under this curve here, the area under this curve is 30 kips. And that is a downward 30 kips. So because the area under this curve between A and B is 30 kips, I know that between those two points, my shear is going to drop by 30 kips. So that means between there and there, between one end of the beam and the other, I will drop down 30 kips. So in other words, I go from 15 kips to negative 15 kips. Now, one other uh, thing to, to mention on this is that I need to have some feel for what the shape of this thing is going to be. So uh, in other words, how do I know it's gonna be this, what the, the, like the line I drew here, a linear line? Why not something like this? Or why not something funky like that? And the reason for this is that um, I know, again, applying the integral relationships, that a uh, that the int I know the integral of a constant value function, which is what this uniform load is. Um, the integral of a constant value function is a uh, linear function. So. If the, uh, if the constant value function is the area I'm considering, or if the, uh, if the load is a constant value function, that means the shear the, uh, function that arises from that will be a uh, linear function. And I, then, I know, then know that it's a linear function, and I know that it, should, that it, have, it should have a negative slope because we're dropping down in shear between these two points. Then at the right hand side of the beam, we can finish this out by just saying at the right hand side of the beam, this 15 kip point load causes this thing to jump back up to zero. So, so we'll, we'll basically our shear will go from 15 to negative 15. And this will have dimensions of five feet and five feet. Questions on this so far? Okay. So let's continue then. Um, now, I next need to look at moment. So next I wanna look at moment. And this will be in kip feet. Now, uh, what I wanna do is in now, in terms of how many things, uh, how many uh, bits of area to divide this into, um, how many areas to take essentially, I need to also consider any points where the shear diagram crosses uh, zero. Because as we saw previously, the location where the shear is uh, zero are the, is, the, is a very uh, possible location for where my moment will be maximized. So um, if I, so now we just apply, uh, uh, now we just apply our area relationships. First of all, at the far end, it, it, these are pin support, this is a pin support. So we're not gonna have any kind of uh, couple or point moments or anything like that, that location that will cause a jump into the moment diagram. Rather, uh, because it's a pin support, I know that I'm going to be starting. I know that I have to be starting and ending at zero. Because I have a simply supported beam, I know that the moment has to be zero at either end. Now I can apply uh, area relationships. Okay, so I have this area here. Maybe I'll call that A2. And area two, is going to be uh, 15 kips times five feet, so 45 kip feet. So 45 kip feet. So that means between this point and this point that my moment should increase uh, by 45 kip feet. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That is a, uh, I am having a severe brain fart today. You are right. <laughs> um, so that should be, uh, oh man, I cannot do math today, apparently. Uh, 15 times five, that will be 75, if I can math correctly. 75 over two is 37.5, I believe. 
Um, yeah, so 15 times two. Uh, 37. Yeah, I think that'll work out. Okay, so 37.5. Contrary to popular opinion, I am not infallible. Okay, so 37.5 kip feet is the uh, is the uh, magnitude of this area, and because it's positive, because the area above the shear curve is positive, I know that I will have a increase in the moment diagram between here and here. Then I could just consider an area three. Um, so maybe this is area three. And this is equal to negative 15 uh, times negative 15 kips times 5 feet and then divided by 2. Because, yes, this is a triangle. So that is an area of negative 37.5. Negative 37.5. And so that means between uh, this location, between the beam center and the far end, I am going to drop by 37.5 and end right back at that zero that we would expect. Now, in terms of the slope I, and, and in terms of the shape of this curve, I know that I have a linear function between these two points, uh, between, say, the center and or the left end and the center, the center and the right end. So if my shear is a linear function, the integral of that must be a quadratic function. So that means between, uh, so, uh, I'm going to have a nonlinear function, namely a quadratic function, and my next decision has to be whether I'm going to have a parabola like this or a parabola like this. In other words, a concave up parabola or a concave down parabola. Now, uh, and to figure out which one, we need to remember that shear is the slope of moment. So that means where, uh, where this shear is equal to zero, I should have a slope of zero at that location. So since the shear is zero at the beam center, the slope of the moment diagram is going to be zero at that location. So that means I can rule out this con the concave up parabola, and instead say this is a uh, this is a concave down parabola, and then the same will hold true as we work down here. So now we have our full shear and moment diagram. We have our um, uh, we now we know our full shear and moment diagram. We saw that a uniform load will produce a triangular uh, shear diagram, and that a uh, a, tr or a triangular or a constant or a linear function shear diagram will produce a quadratic uh, load diagram or quadratic moment diagram. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, I, okay, so the question is, when would it the moment start below? Like, when would it start below the axis? And I think the next uh, example, we may look at that. We're, uh, I think we'll look at a, a cantilever beam to figure out where uh, shear would end up, or where moment would end up negative, where you'd have a, uh, the moment starting negative rather than at zero. Okay, that work? Okay. Yeah, I think our next example is going to be a cantilever. I think that will illustrate that pretty well. So I'm going to erase this one. But yeah, good question. I know it's tricky. There, there are no, um, it's one of those things that I can write the rules out, but until you actually uh, see it, until you actually practice it, it uh, can be difficult to really get down. But the reason I'm teaching the method of sections, or sorry, the method of inspection here, is that it often really is the fastest, most direct way to get a shear and moment diagram. And especially, it's very useful for rapidly figuring out the locations and magnitudes of max shear and moment. If you know how to do it and you don't make simple math errors like I do, apparently, um, you can get the shear and moment diagram relatively easily in many cases. All right, so. Um, let's work through a different example. Can, wait, can I erase this board here? Anybody care if I do that? Okay, I'll go ahead and knock both them out and give myself some more space. 
And in fact, I think I'll make a cantilever beam where uh, that itself is loaded with a, uh, a point couple or a point moment. Just to have maximum uh, momenty goodness. In fact, I promise that the next problem is going to be quite momentous. Now she's making puns. It's just all downhill from here. All right, let's get going. So, uh, let's see. Let's make a beam, a happy beam. Bob Ross's happy beam. So let's make this a cantilever. And let's see. Maybe I'll go and put a, um, I guess I'll put a, yeah, I'll put a force like this on it. A downward force of, I don't know, um, 10 kips like this. And uh, we also, let's let's put a, oh, we need some dimensions on this, but uh, let's say there is a, mm, I'll make a clockwise couple here. And let's say this is 100 kip feet. And dimensions. Uh, let's say this is 12 feet and 12 feet. And so we have this beam, all of this is given, and then find our V and M diagram. All right, so uh, the first thing you need to do is find any reactions, and there are definitely going to be reactions. So maybe I'll call these points A, B, and C. Now, um, point A, uh, let's see, so I'm going to have an AY and an MA. And I'm going to apply, I'm going to first apply free, uh, a, a global equilibrium uh, to the entire uh, beam and say, okay, the summation of forces in the Y direction is positive AY, positive AY, upward, because AY is upward, minus 10 kips, and this is equal to zero because we're in static equilibrium, this isn't a dynamics course, and AY is then equal to 10 kips. So we have, so there will be a, a 10 kip rea uh, upward force on the left-hand side of the beam, and then summation of moments, and I'm gonna take the summation of moments about a Y naught, that way I don't have to worry about the moment generated by my AY, and let's see, this is going to be, I'm going to have, uh, well, first I'll have this MA, and that's going to be positive because it's counterclockwise. Then I'll have the moment caused by this 100 kip point moment. So that's going to be uh, minus 100 kips. And it's minus, again, because we are uh, 100 kip feet, sorry. Uh, and it's minus because it is in the clockwise direction. And then the moment generated by our uh, end force here. And that's going to be uh, simply uh, 10 kips times the overall length of a moment arm length of 24 feet. So that's going to be, let's just write that out. And it will be minus because it's in the clockwise direction from point A's perspective. So minus 10 kips uh, times 24 feet. And so MA minus 100 uh, minus 240 is equal to zero, or simply MA is equal to 340 kip feet. So I now have my reactions. So I'm gonna create the shear and moment diagrams on this board over here. And to do that, I'm going to just draw out a free body diagram first. So I have my MA. Uh, which uh, is acting in the direction I assumed it is a counterclockwise or positive moment, counterclockwise or positive reaction moment. So I'll have this 340 uh, moment here. 
And then I will have an upward force, my reaction of my AY reaction of 10 kips. Uh, then I will have a couple at this location at the beam center, a, uh, a clockwise couple of 100 kip feet. And then I'll have a downward point load of 10 kips at the far end of the beam, at the free end of the beam. So um, we're going to, as we're working through this, we have a very good way of checking our results. And that is that at the free end of this beam, um, after that 10 kip point load has been applied, I would expect after that, that both the, um, both the shear and moment diagrams should come to zero. This is the free end of an M, uh, of a beam. And so the free end of a cantilever beam should have no shear and moment on it because there's nowhere to deliver that shear and moment to. At the very end of the beam, everything should come back to zero. So if we don't get that, we know we did something wrong. Well, actually the shear is gonna, should come down to like positive 10 and then the point load will cause it to drop down, but we'll take a look at that. Okay, so I'm going to put some projection lines on here. As shown. And my shear diagram is going to be, thankfully, relatively simple. So V here in kips. So my shear here is in kips. And then, um, initially, I'm, okay, so in terms of areas to integrate, there actually aren't any areas at all to integrate uh, for my shear. Because if you look at it, there's, uh, there is no load diagram, a W as a function of X to integrate, so I can't find an area under a curve. Instead, all that's going to happen is I'm going to come to the left side of this beam, and this 10 kip uh, upward reaction is going to cause the shear to immediately jump up to 10 kips. Then, between this point and the far end, uh, there is nothing that will change the shear. There shouldn't be anything that will change the shear between those two points because, yes, there is this point moment here, but a point moment has no effect on shear. It's, uh, it is a moment, not a force, so it's not going to have any effect on shear. So instead, and also because we have no distributed load, because of those two facts, the shear is just going to remain constant all the way across the beam. And so what's then going to happen is, again, we pop up to the 10 at the left-hand side, we remain constant all the way across, and then we drop back down uh, our downward point force here, our downward force here causes the shear diagram to drop back to zero, which is what we would expect at the free end of a beam. So uh, then let's look at moment. So we have our shear diagram, and now we need to create our moment diagram. So now let's create a moment diagram. Now we need to apply our, um, we need to carefully apply our, um, our relationships here, our, uh, our uh, couples and such. And so to do that, uh, let's think about this. So on this side of the beam, I have a positive external moment applied, at, at, applied effectively right at A. And because that's a positive external moment, it's going to cause the uh, internal moment to drop. Uh, by equal to its magnitude. So we're not going to jump up at, to 340, we're going to start down at negative 340. So we start down here at negative 340. Uh, kip feet. So we start there down here at negative 340. Now, um, the shear is positive all the way along, so that means the area uh, under this curve between any two points will also be positive. And let's look at the area between A and B. Uh, so again, we have points A, B, and C. So the area, so we'll have two areas we need to consider. I'll call this one A1, this one A2. But A1 and A2 are actually both, they're going to be applied separately, but they're actually of the same magnitude and sign. Both of them are just going to be a dimension of 12 feet times a height of 10 kips. Uh, and that is 120 kip feet. 
and this is positive. And so when we take the area under a under the curve, the uh, positive the area is positive. So that will cause an increase in the shear diagram as we are in the moment diagram as we move along. All right, and then let's see here. So we have a uh, so we're going to increase between A and B. We're going to increase by a, our moment diagram by an area equal to A1. And so that means we are going to increase by 120 between points A and B. So negative 340 plus 120 is negative 220. So negative uh, 220 here. Then, um, again, that will increase uh, to negative 220 by increasing 120 between points A and B. Then at this location, our couple here, our applied couple, is going to cause another jump in the moment diagram. Uh, now, this is a, uh, a negative external moment or a clockwise external moment, but it is a positive internal moment, so it's going to cause a jump, a positive jump in the moment diagram. And so that's going to increase things to negative 120. Then, so again, we have a negative external moment and that means a positive change in the moment diagram. So I know we kind we kind of handle point loads and moments uh, differently. A downward point moment will cause a da a decrease in the shear, and an upward point I'm uh, sorry a downward point force will cause a, a decrease in the shear diagram. And so there's a direct correlation there. But with the moments, it's the opposite. And the reason for that again is the negative in the integral uh, for w for uh, of w as a function of x, the, where shear is the equal to the negative integral of w as a function of x. Okay. Now, in terms of area two between points uh, b and c, this thing is going to increase by another 120 because again, uh, between the shear between points a and b has an area of 120 which means that our shear, that our moment diagram will increase by 120 between points B and C. So we go, so that'll then bring us right back to zero, which is exactly what we would expect. Okay, I know that was a lot. Questions on this? Does that kind of hopefully clear up how we handle point loads, point moments? Again, with uh, shear, uh, it's sort of it's sort of a nice simple direct correlation. A uh, a downward point force will cause a direct drop in the shear diagram, but with moments it's the opposite. And again, and the reason those uh, that difference exists is that we only have that negative on the, uh, uh, the 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 load to shear function. And again, all of that ultimately comes out of how we've just chosen to uh, define our uh, uh, our sign conventions for shear, moment, and uh, load. We've chosen some interesting positives and negatives uh, just historically, and that uh, ends up, uh, that's fine. We've chosen sign conventions that are most convenient for your design, but that does introduce a few uh, interesting uh, little foibles that we need to be aware of when looking at uh, VNM diagrams. Okay, so I think we might have time for one more example. Any questions before we erase this and move on? All right, so let's try to squeeze in one last example here. All right, let's make a fun one for a certain definition of fun. All 
right, so let's see, what could we do? We've looked at point moments, we've looked at point loads. Uh, what if you have a load function that is something like this? What if your load function is triangular? How do we get the V&M diagram? Uh, how do we get a V&M diagram as a uh, function uh, with this, with this kind of load function? So uh, let's say this goes up to six kips per foot. And let's give this a length of, oh, I don't know, 18 feet. So as always, our first step will be to first find our reactions. And I'll just call these points A and B, which means we'll have an AY and a BY. Now, we need to first find the equivalent point force of this uh, distributed load in order to find the reactions. And that is just going to be 1 half base times height. So 1 half uh, times 6 kips per foot uh, times 18, times 18 feet. Uh, half of 18 is 9, 9 times 6 is 54, so I believe if I managed to math that correctly, uh, that should be uh, 54 kips. So that equals 54 kips. Okay. Again, yeah, uh, 1 half times uh, 18 is 9, 9 times 6 is 54, yes. And in terms of the location of this equivalent point force, this is going to be uh, one third from the, uh, from the triangle's base, or simply six feet, and then a dimension of 12 feet from the left-hand side. Now I wanna go ahead and get the moments, or sorry, get the uh, reactions, and I'm going, to get that by, I'm going to do that by balancing moments. So summation of moments about A, counterclockwise positive, is uh, this should be, uh, hopefully at this point, this should be second nature. This is a negative because we are clo uh, rotating clockwise about point A. So negative 54 kips times a moment arm length of 12 feet uh, plus by times a moment arm length of 18 feet. And all of that then equals zero. Uh, let's see, to, so I need to find by, and to simplify that, I'm going to just, uh, first of all, I'm just gonna make some simplifications by dividing across by, oh, let's do three, so that is then a four, that's a six, and then if I divide across by six, uh, that's a one, and that's a nine. So I now then have uh, that by, uh, let's see, is equal to, that should be just 36 kips, I believe. 36 kips. And then summation of moments about point A. Counterclockwise positive, let's see. We're going to have, oh, sorry, I need to do summation of moments about point B to get AY. Uh, and then I'll have a, a paused moment caused by my equivalent point force. So uh, 54 kip feet, or 54 kips times a moment arm length of six feet six feet here, and then a y will generate a negative moment about point B, so minus a y times a moment arm length of 18 feet. And all of this equals zero, because we're in static equilibrium. And again, I'm first going to divide across by six, that will produce a uh, three here, and then divide across by three, and that will be, let's see, is that, that is divisible by three, that is, uh, that should be, what is 54 divided by three, that should be 20, and then, so 18. Oh, that's a one there. Okay, so therefore, AY is 18 kips. And adding these two together, I can do, a, I can check that by just doing a summation of forces in the Y direction. Uh, that will be uh, AY plus BY, minus 54, and AY is 18, positive 18, BY is 36, minus 54, and 36 plus eight is 44, plus 10 is 54, and so indeed that does come to zero. So we have our reactions. Simple enough for a certain definition of simple. Now, um, I'm going to, uh, for the sake of creating my free body diagram, I'm first, or for the sake of creating my moment diagram, I'm first going to construct a free body diagram of the beam again, 
showing the reactions. And I'm going to have a Ay equal to 18 kips. And then a and then a By um, equal to 36 on this side. Uh, 36 kips on this side. And then the air, the, uh, let's see. And then I'm going to have my distributed load, my triangular distributed load, all the way across here. And that peaks at six kips per foot. So my shear, I'm gonna put, well, I'm gonna put my, uh, I am gonna put my projection lines on here. So let's figure this out. Um, first I'll draw my shear diagram, V in kips. Now, first our moment, di first our, uh, we need to look at the effect of the point force. And that's this is going to cause our uh, shear to jump up 18 kips because it's a positive uh, point force or a reaction in this case, but it's still a point force uh, directing upward positive 18 kips. So we're up here at positive 18. Then between these two points, between A and B, we're going to drop a uh, amount of shear equal to the area under this curve. And so that means uh, one half base times height here is going to be that 54 kips. So that means we're going to drop down uh, 54 kips between this point and this point between A and B and 18 minus uh, 54 is in fact negative 36, at which point we'll jump back up to zero from our uh, force on the right-hand side, our reaction force. Now, in terms of slope, remember, in terms of, so in terms of function, I know this is gonna be quadratic, and my question, my, my next task is to figure out whether it's quadratic like this or quadratic like this. In other words, whether it's concave up or concave down. Well, the slope, because load is the, is the slope of shear, um, I know that I should have zero slope at the left-hand side here because my load starts at zero, and it should become increasingly negative as we go down. And so we end up with a shear with a, uh, a moment function, or sorry, a shear function that looks like that. Now um, we're about out of time, but I, what I will say is I will give some guidelines on finishing this problem out. It's not too bad, although I would uh, you might need to consult a uh, moment table to a uh, area table to, to get the exact. Uh, you, need, you need to find a table that gives you the centroid and area of a parabolic spandrel and a parabola. And so you, what you'd want to do is you would find this area, area three, or maybe I could just call that uh, uh, area one or something, and then be this one area two. This one will cause a increase in the moment diagram. So your moment diagram will end up looking something like this, um, where it would be a, a cubic function and it will drop down to zero. And the point of max moment will be right here, right where the shear is at zero. But again, to find that value, I'd want to find the area under this uh, section of parabola and the area of this parabolic spandrel, but we're a bit out of time. So I think that, uh, I just wanted to illustrate the process there. All right, that'll do it for today. As we've seen, we have now explored the uh, finding shear moment diagrams by inspection, by the method of inspection. We've learned how to apply the uh, derivative and integral relationships between load, shear, and moment uh, to apply them graphically to find the slopes and, and uh, values, both uh, edge and maximal values of shear and moment uh, uh, functions and uh, plots, and this is our. Th and then we, and as such, we have now completed our third look at uh, various methods of finding shear and moment diagrams. I hope you found this video uh, useful. Hope you have. Hope, hope you found it a little bit educational, uh, or perhaps a little bit enjoyable. Regardless, uh, if you have if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe to make the robots happy, etc. Um, and regardless, I hope to see you all again soon. And as always, thank you.